Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's ethics series. In this video, we're going to be going through 30 different ethics cases. Now, let me start by saying that these cases are not meant to, in and of themselves, be all you need to review for ethics. If you've reviewed my channel, you're pretty well aware that I have an ethics series with lots of different videos that talk more about the actual concepts and principles than actually have practice questions. So this video is not meant to replace those videos, it's meant to supplement those videos. So perhaps after you watch my other ethics videos, you could return to this video and go through these 30 cases because this does bring up a lot of important and high yield ethical dilemmas. Now on USMLE and Comlex, ethics tends to be really difficult. And in reality, these are ethical scenarios that in real life are somewhat easy to navigate, but on tests are really confusing. The reason that they're really confusing is because a lot of the different answers will sound really convincing and you'll be torn with which one is more correct. So ethics is one of those categories where there's going to be one answer that's more correct, even though several probably sound appealing. So in this video, again, we're just going to go through 30 different cases. I'll be describing and talking about ethical scenarios and principles that you should keep in mind on test day. Part of the purpose of this video is to develop patterns of thinking so that if you encounter a similar ethical scenario on your test, you've already seen it once before and you can make a more educated guess. So let's get into our first case. You work in a high volume clinic that does allergy testing. One day, the electronic medical record system has an internet outage, and as a result, your patient's wait time increases. One patient comes back to the room after waiting for two and a half hours. He is frustrated and lashes out at your staff for the inappropriate wait time. Which of the following is the best initial response? A. I am sorry for the wait. Please know I will spend the full amount of normal patient time with you. B. I am so sorry for the wait. Our electronic medical record system had an internet outage and we were very backed up. C. I am so sorry for the wait. Please do not yell at my staff as they had nothing to do with the reason for your wait. D. I am so sorry for the wait. You are entitled to be angry about this terrible circumstance. E. I am so sorry for the wait. While you are entitled to be angry, please do not yell at my staff as it compromises the provider-patient relationship. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about this. And if you're ready, here's the answer. The answer to this one is D. Whenever you get an ethical scenario where a patient is angry about something that's obviously beyond the control of you as the physician or, you know, the physician in the question, the answer is to always hear the patient out first. So first, apologize and give them the space to be upset. That is the first and foremost principle of these questions. Always allow them to express whatever feeling or emotion that they have, even if it's destructive, such as yelling at staff and being mean to you as the physician. What you don't want to do is explain why there was a wait or explain why something happened that made the patient mad. So in this question, you would never pick choice B. Choice B says, I'm so sorry for the wait. Our electronic medical record system had an internet outage. So Basically, by telling them that there was an internet outage, you're essentially just giving them an excuse. And even though that's actually what happened here, you never want to give them a reason or justification for why something happened. That's never, ever, ever going to be the correct answer. So never pick that answer on USMLE and Comlex. Now, choice C here is a little bit abrasive, if you will. When you're telling them, please do not yell at my staff, even though that's something that you could reasonably say in real life, on a test, that's never the correct answer because it's slightly confrontational. And E is also of the same flavor. So E sounds a little bit better because you're acknowledging their entitlement to be angry. But once again, you're telling them not to yell at your staff. And being confrontational is never going to be the correct answer in these ethical situations. So the choice, the best choice here is choice D because it is the one that you, you say sorry and you give them that moment to be angry and you acknowledge the entitlement to their anger. That is the correct answer. Case number two. A seven-year-old boy unfortunately loses his older sister due to glioblastoma multiforme. He is diagnosed with adjustment disorder following her death, and he feels responsible for the death of his sibling. Which of the following is the best way to describe the events of his sister's passing? A. She had a problem in her brain that caused her death. B. She had something called glioblastoma multiforme, which is cancer that spreads in the brain. C. It was her time to go to heaven. D. She was very sick for a long time and now isn't suffering anymore. 
E. It is not your fault. These things happen in life. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about this. And if you're ready, here's the answer. So the correct answer here is A. She had a problem in her brain that caused her death. So the principle here, and I've written it in as blue text, is that you want to provide direct and easy to understand descriptions that directly capture the events that happened. So once you reach about, let's say, five or six years old, you have an understanding as a child in normal development that death is irreversible, that it happens, and once people die, they aren't coming back. So the recommendation for conveying death and describing death to these young children is that you need to provide direct explanations about what happened, but that are in a concrete and easy to understand way. So by contrast, choice B would be incorrect because you're saying that she has glioblastoma multiforme and that description is too abstract for a five to seven year old. It's just not going to work. You also want to avoid things like cliches. So choice C, it was her time to go to heaven. That's really not the recommendation here. And even though that sounds like something that most people might say in real life, such as it was her time to go to heaven or, you know, she's never coming back. She's in a better place. All of those cliches you want to avoid because, again, they don't really capture the direct nature of death. And a normal developing five to seven year old does have the capacity and the ability to understand the irreversibility of death. So the theme for these types of ethical questions is that you always want to provide direct, easy to understand uh, descriptions and avoid cliches. Again, choice D is a cliche and choice E is too vague. So it has to be direct and capture that she's dead, but it has to be easy to understand and concrete. So that's the answer here. And that's the sort of pattern that you want to follow in these types of questions. Let's move on to the next case. A 76-year-old male is diagnosed with stage 4 adenocarcinoma of the lung. He confides in you privately that he does not want his family to know the details of his diagnosis, and he wants to, quote, die in dignity without burdening my family, end quote. As you exit the room, his family sees you leaving the room, and they want to know what the results of the patient's biopsy showed. Which of the following is the correct response? A. You should discuss the results with your family member. B. I am not permitted to disclose the results to you without express written permission from the patient. C. I am not permitted to disclose the results to you without express verbal permission from the patient. D. I am not permitted to disclose the results to you without express written or verbal permission from the patient. Or E. I am not allowed to say whether or not I am your loved one's physician. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about it. And if you're ready for the answer, here we go. So the correct answer choice here is D. I am not permitted to disclose the results to you without express written or verbal permission from the patient. This question captures two or three themes in ethical scenarios that you should be aware of. The first is regarding confidentiality. In order for you to tell a patient's family members or anybody for that matter, information that is protected health information, you need either the written or verbal permission from the patient. It can be either, right? They can sign a piece of paper that allows you to release the information or they can give you verbal permission to release the information. But without one or the other, you cannot give information even to family members. Now, I'm sure a lot of you thought that choice E was a sexy appearing answer choice. And it, it really is because this is what you're supposed to say if you see a patient in public and then there's so let me let me pause for a second there's this classic ethical question where you're out to dinner with a colleague and a patient that you care for is in the restaurant the patient walks by and either like smiles or waves and then the colleague as the patient walks away turns to you and says is that your patient the correct answer in that scenario is that you're not allowed to say whether or not you're their physician so you literally as robotic and crazy as this sounds that what you say to your colleague is I am not allowed to tell you whether or not I am that person's physician. And when you say that, you're obviously implying that you are, but that's still the correct ethical, legal, moral answer. So in terms of confidentiality and this question, answer choice E sounds really good. But the reason that it's incorrect in this scenario is that his family already knows and can imply that you're the physician because you came out of the room. And therefore, the best initial correct response is D that you're not allowed to disclose information to them without the express written or verbal permission from the patient. Okay, so that's the answer choice here. Let's move on. The patient provides verbal permission for his information to be sent to his primary care physician. So same patient in the question before, and now he's giving verbal permission for you to send his new diagnosis 
to his PCP. The hospital where you reside has a policy where the patient must first sign a release of information in order to release his confidential information. In this case, which of the following is true regarding the release of the patient's confidential protected health information? A. Patients must always sign a release of information, otherwise the information cannot be released. B. Express verbal permission is sufficient to release protected health information. C. Hospitals may impose additional requirements for the release of protected health information. D. In states where release of information is required, both verbal and written permission must be obtained. Or E. Written permission is not required since the primary care physician already knows the patient. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about this. And if you're ready, here we go. Answer is C. So hospitals may impose additional requirements for the release of protected health information. So this is really important regarding confidentiality because as you learned in the previous question, either giving your verbal or written consent is normally enough to release protected health information. However, if you're a patient in a health system that has additional requirements, such as signing a release of information, that has to be done before the hospital that you're currently residing in can release your confidential protected health information. So high yield to know that hospitals may impose additional requirements, but the bare minimum is express written or verbal consent to release that information. Next question. A 29-year-old female with a severe autoimmune disease has been treated with multiple infusions of immunotherapy to control the severity of her illness for many years. She's missed many appointments and shows up late, consistently. She never stays for the full duration of her treatment. Today, she tells you that she does not want to get her infusion because she has dyspepsia, so she's got an upset stomach. Recognizing that the patient will likely not adhere to her treatment, which of the following is the best immediate course of action? A. Kindly refer the patient to a colleague with whom she has better rapport, explaining that she might prefer their care better. B. Very respectfully discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment. C. Kindly educate the patient about the dangerousness of mistreatments, but explain that ultimately it's her decision. D. Kindly tell the patient that your relationship is an obvious barrier to treatment and provide her with alternative physicians that she can find after 30 days or E, attempt to understand why she doesn't adhere to treatment. Pause the video if you need some time to think about this one. And if you're ready, let's get going. So the answer here is E, attempt to understand why she doesn't adhere to treatment. So a lot of these answers sound admittedly really good. And when I saw this question, I had some difficulty with it. And I think that the way to approach these scenarios is that the first thing you always wanna do is take a very neutral stance on every scenario. So you're gonna be presented with questions where the patient is making an obviously terrible decision. They need some kind of life-saving treatment or some kind of infusion, blood transfusion, whatever it is, and they're not gonna to wanna to do it. It doesn't matter why they wanna do it, whether it's personal reasons, financial reasons, religious reasons, but the theme here is that you always take a neutral stance and first, you attempt to understand why they don't want it done. And that's choice E here. Once you understand why they don't want it done and you can get gain an appreciation for what is the reason that this patient is refusing something that's obviously indicated, then you would do choice B. Then you would talk about the risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment. The problem with picking choice B and diving right into that is that you're doing that from a non-neutral place. If you just put on your doctor hat and start telling them, well, let me tell you about the risks of not doing your infusion, then you're being a little bit judgmental when you should first take a neutral stance. And that's why choice E here is the correct answer. Something that you should also know, just as an aside, is that choice D here, if you're going to do something like close a practice or fire a patient because you're, you do, in fact, have a problem with the doctor-patient relationship, you have to give them alternative physicians that they can seek care for, and you also have to provide care for them for at least 30 days. And that's why I put that answer in there, just to bring that, that prospect up or to bring that idea up. So, the takeaway from this question is always remember to take a neutral, a neutral stance when a patient's doing something that's obviously stupid. And then after you have that neutral stance and you can understand why they want or don't want something, then you put on your doctor hat and you discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives. 
And then in another scenario, if you have to release a patient from your care, you give them alternative physicians that they can go to and you provide care to them for an additional 30 days. So lots of high yield ideas, lots of high yield concepts, all of these different things are bound to come up in one question or another. Next case, you're out spending the day at a local park when a patient that you care for at the clinic approaches you. She explains that she has always been very sexually attracted to you and would like to go on a date. You kindly refuse her advances. When seeing this patient in the clinic, you know, presumably after this has happened, which of the following is the best initial action? A. Use a chaperone in all situations. B. Explain to the patient that you will refer her to a colleague in the clinic. C. Explain that her advances are appreciated but inappropriate. D. Kindly explain that if she does not stop, you will not be able to care for her anymore. Or E. Attempt to understand why she finds you attractive. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about it. And if you're ready, let's talk ethics. So the answer here is A, use a chaperone in all situations. This is another question where a lot of the answer choices sound really appealing. So let's talk about why some things are incorrect here. Some of you might have chosen uh, E, attempt to understand why she finds you attractive. And maybe the reason that you chose that answer was because it starts with attempt to understand. And in a previous question, I just told you that you should always take a neutral approach. But this is one of those scenarios where taking a neutral approach is actually incorrect. It doesn't matter why she finds you attractive. You don't attempt to find out. Could you imagine sitting down with that patient and, and looking her in the eye and saying, please tell me why you find me so handsome. That's, that's not the right answer. You can see that that in and of itself, even though you're taking that neutral stance, is inappropriate. So you're definitely not going to do that. It, explaining to the patient that you'll refer them to a colleague, choice B, is only appropriate if the patient continues to make sexual advances towards you. You don't just immediately cut them off and refer them to somebody else. And that also sort of explains why choice D is not the correct answer. Choice D sounds really good, but you're not going to do that until the patient continuously makes more sexual advances despite you putting certain barriers in place. Choice C is wrong because you would never tell somebody that you appreciate their sexual advances. That in and of itself is also inappropriate. So explain that her advances are appreciated but inappropriate is really inappropriate. You're not going to look somebody in the eye and be like, look, thank you for telling me how handsome I am. But, you know, that's inappropriate. What you've just said there is inappropriate. So you're not going to do that. So the, the answer here that's correct is using a chaperone, which means that you're going to bring a female staff member with you into the room when you see this female patient so that you have a neutral third party that can make sure that no funky business happens when you're seeing that patient. Next case, a patient is diagnosed with syphilis. Which of the following is true? A, the patient must give permission to report this to public health officials. B, the information can be released to public health officials only if the patient refuses treatment. C, the information can be released to public health officials only if the patient was diagnosed within the past three months. D, the physician and or hospital has a legal obligation to report this to public health officials in all scenarios. Or E, the information is not reportable based on federal law. Pause the video if you want to think about it, but if you're ready, here we go. The answer here is D. The physician and or hospital has a legal obligation to report this to public health officials in all scenarios. So this question highlights something very important with regards to confidentiality. There are certain diseases that are, cons that are considered reportable diseases. And I, I do have a video where I sing a song that helps you memorize all of the major high yield reportable diseases. So please check that out when you have some time. But syphilis is one of them, which means that if a patient is diagnosed with syphilis, it doesn't matter when they're diagnosed, so cross out choice C, and it doesn't matter whether or not they're in treatment, so cross out choice B, and it doesn't matter whether or not the patient gives you permission, so cross out choice A, but in all scenarios, if the patient is diagnosed with a reportable disease, you have to report that to the public health officials. Okay, so these are things like syphilis, HIV, etc. And you can learn again, learn all the reportable diseases in my reportable disease song. But the takeaway from this question is that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If you diagnose them with a reportable disease, you report it to the public health officials. And in that process, the information is still kept confidential. It's not like anybody's going to know that, you know, this person's friend isn't going to know that they have syphilis. It's just the public health official. So in the process of reporting it, it's still confidential and it's still HIPAA protected, but you have to report it to the public health officials 
if it's a reportable disease. So that's why I wrote this question. Let's move to the next case. A patient has low back pain for two days. He takes ibuprofen, but the pain is not relieved. He has a friend who convinces the patient that his pain is likely secondary to a herniated disc in his low back, and the patient requests an epidural steroid injection. Which of the following is the best course of action? A. Do not give an epidural steroid injection. B. Explain that the patient's friend is wrong and that epidural steroid injections constitute an unnecessary procedure. C. Explain that while it's possible that the pain is caused by a herniation, it's more important to follow your conservative treatment first before resorting to invasive procedures. D. Give the epidural steroid injection. Or E. Give the epidural steroid injection only after explaining the risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment. Pause the video if you'd like to think about this. And if you're ready, let's talk ethics. So the answer here is A, do not give the epidural steroid injection. In this case, an epidural steroid injection for low back pain lasting only two days is what is considered an unnecessary procedure. So a couple things that we need to talk about first, and I, I really didn't want to make this video too clinical, but I guess with, we have to talk about low back pain before we talk about this question. So low back pain is the number one primary care in-office complaint in the United States. And very early on, you have to treat it conservatively, which means rest, you know, ice, a little bit of physical therapy, strengthening, stretching, swimming, all that conservative, fluffy stuff. And only after a certain period of time do you move to more invasive procedures and testing. So you don't get an MRI or an X-ray right off the bat. So you wait a little bit. It's just not indicated. So in this case, there's been low back pain for two days, and he took ibuprofen once, but it's not relieved. An epidural steroid injection this early on in low back pain without MRI to confirm anything is an unnecessary procedure. So you do not give it. Now let's talk about the ethical scenario here and why the other choices are incorrect. So choice B starts by saying, explain that the patient's friend is wrong. And that first part of the sentence, even if the second part sounds really good, is confrontational. So we're not going to choose choice B. Choice C says, explain that while it's possible that the pain is caused by a herniation, it's more important to follow your conservative treatment first before resorting to invasive procedures. So in real life, this sounds really good, and it might be what you do in the future when you're an attending physician. But on USMLE and Comlex, it's too narcissistic. You can't pick an answer that says, it's more important to follow my treatment first. That is just way too confrontational and narcissistic, and you're not going to pick it. Choice D, you're obviously not giving the steroid injection, so just cross that out. And then choice E, you would never give it. It doesn't matter if you explain risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment. You would never give somebody something that's unnecessary this early on in low back pain. So that is just not indicated, and therefore choice E is not the correct answer. Next case, a patient is diagnosed with HIV. The patient thinks that they may have had recent sexual intercourse with a partner who is unaware of the patient's sexually transmitted infection. However, the patient refuses to inform that potential partner, that potential person who might also have HIV, if in fact this patient has it. Which of the following is the best immediate response to the patient? A. I am legally required to inform your partner. B. I am legally required to inform your partner that they may have been exposed to HIV, but I will not reveal your identity as the possible exposure. C. HIV is not a reportable disease. However, I encourage you to discuss this with your partner. D. I have to report this to public health officials, but it is your responsibility to report this to your partners. E. I encourage you to discuss this with your partner, but I will not discuss your diagnosis with them. Pause the video if you'd like to think about this. And if you're ready, here we go. Correct answer here is choice E. I encourage you to discuss this with your partner, but I will not discuss your diagnosis with them. So HIV, as we've talked about a few slides ago, is a reportable disease, which means that you as the physician 100% have to report this to the public health officials. However, if a patient does not want to tell their partner, you are not allowed to tell them. You absolutely cannot tell them. So choice E is correct, and I know that some of you probably think that choice D sounds really good as well. But the reason that choice D is not correct is because of the second part of the sentence. So the first part, I have to report this to public health officials, is 100% correct. But the second part that begins with, but it is your responsibility to report this to your partners, is incorrect because it places too much of a burden of responsibility on the patient. And whenever an answer does that on an ethical question, 
it's never going to be the correct answer. So it's putting too much burden on the patient and removing yourself from the role. And imagine you telling a patient exactly what choice D says. It just sounds a little aggressive. C is obviously not correct because HIV is a reportable disease. B, you're not allowed to talk to the patient's partner, so that's incorrect. And then A, I'm legally required to inform your partner is just obviously wrong based on our conversation here. So the point and the takeaway of this question is that for reportable diseases, you do report them to public health officials, but you do not tell a possible partner exposure. That is for the patient to do. But you do not put the burden on them by saying it is your responsibility to tell them that they were exposed. So, you know, be kind about it, be understanding, but remember, you can't do it if they won't let you. Next case. A patient with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis wants to end his life. Using a dictation service, he explains that his quality of life has deteriorated to the point where all he thinks about is suicide and he would appreciate your assistance in ending his life. It is confirmed that the patient is at the end stage of his illness. Which of the following is the most appropriate response? A. I am unable to assist you in ending your life in any way possible. B. I empathize with you and regret to inform you that physicians cannot provide euthanasia. C. Because you are end stage, it is my duty to help you end your life if those are indeed your wishes. D. While I cannot provide euthanasia, I am able to give you medications that might incidentally shorten your life. E. I am so sorry. Let's discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives to euthanasia. Pause the video if you'd like to think about it. And if you're ready, here we go. So this is a really challenging, ethically contentious topic. And the correct answer here is D. While I cannot provide euthanasia, I am able to give you medications that might incidentally shorten your life. So first fact and first high yield takeaway is that physicians cannot perform euthanasia. Absolutely 100% true. In no scenario can a physician do this. There are obviously states in the United States where physician-assisted suicide is legal, but because you're taking USMLE or Comlex, the answer choice is not going to be controversial, and therefore it's not going to require you to know that. So throw that out of your brain for, for just a second. In this case, you are allowed to give patients medications that might incidentally shorten their life. So for example, if you're controlling somebody's pain and you're giving them something like benzos or whatever it, whatever it is, you might suppress their respiratory drive and they might ultimately succumb to death sooner as a result of your palliative medications. However, you cannot provide euthanasia per se. And you are allowed to tell patients this. In, in, you know, for full disclosure, you're allowed to tell them, I'm giving you medications that might end up shortening your life, but I'm not allowed to uh, assist you with physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. Choice E does sound really good, right? It says, I'm so sorry, let's discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives to euthanasia. And that is something that you might say in real life, but the most appropriate response is to tell them point blank, I cannot provide euthanasia, but I am able to give you these medications. So that's why D is a better answer than choice E. Uh, choice C is wrong because you're not allowed to help someone end their life, doesn't matter what stage of the disease they're in. Choice B is technically correct, but it's not the most appropriate response because in this choice, you have to tell them that there are available medications for them. And because their life is deteriorated and they can't even talk, presumably, because they're using, using the dictation service and their end stage. You don't want to beat around the bush with this patient. You want to let them know up front that you can give them some medications that can make them feel better and that may incidentally shorten their life but are not euthanasia per se. And then A, I am unable to assist you in ending your life in any way possible. Technically is correct in the sense that you're not providing euthanasia, but it's technically incorrect in the sense that you are allowed to assist them by giving them palliative medications per choice D, that could incidentally shorten their life. So this is a very contentious question. And I understand that a lot of you are going to you know, raise the pitchforks and be like, but why is choice E not correct? I swear, dirty. It's the right answer. And, you know, the point of this is to have a discussion so that when you see the question, you can be better prepared to tackle it. So, you know, forgive me for writing question answers that sound all really sexy. But the point of this question is to understand that A, physicians don't do euthanasia. B, physicians can give incidentally shortening medications and, you know, hopefully you've learned something from this question. So let's, let's just move on before we get in an argument. Um, next case, a patient who is admitted to the hospital for community-acquired pneumonia is being discharged today. He's an elderly man who is often forgetful, but he still has preserved cognitive ability. He lives alone with limited support. When discharging him, 
you go over all of his medications and when to take them. Which of the following is the most effective strategy to ensure that the patient continues to take his medications correctly once he goes home? A. You should take the blue pill that you see right here by mouth three times a day with food. B. Please purchase a pill dispenser from your local pharmacy so that you can remember to take your blue pill. C. Tell me when you're supposed to take your blue pill. D. I have written in your discharge instructions exactly when to take your blue pill. E. Please use this pill schedule that I've created for you in order to remember when to take the blue pill. Pause the video if you'd like to think about this. And if you're ready, let's talk about strategies for taking this blue pill. So the answer that's correct is choice C. Tell me when you're supposed to take your blue pill. So the question here is written to teach one high yield thing. The most effective strategy for getting patients to learn seemingly complex medical instructions or information is what's known as the teach back method. So this is where you tell the patient something. So you do a little bit of teaching. So you say, look, you were in the hospital because you got community acquired pneumonia. You had a fever, you had an elevated white blood cell count, which means that you had an infection and we treated you with IV antibiotics. When you started to get better, we transitioned you to oral antibiotics. And now we're discharging you home and we would like you to take this blue pill three times a day by mouth with food. Now, please tell me why you are here, what medication you're supposed to be taking and how often you take it. So what you're doing is teach back. You teach to them and then you ask the patient to say it back to you. That has been proven to be the most effective way to counsel and educate patients on what they're supposed to do from the time that they're discharged once they go home. The other answer choices here, choice D and choice E, are also really nice answer choices because they are providing written instructions to the patient and written instructions have been shown to be very educational. However, the teach back method has been shown to be more effective. So D and E are both written instructions and therefore they're basically saying the same thing. So if you're taking this question, if you're taking USMLE or Comlex and you get a question like this and you see choice D and E and they both sound really good, they do. What you should recognize from a test taking strategy is that both D and E are written instructions and therefore one is no better than the other, so they're both wrong. So that's why those answer choices are wrong. B, you're not gonna tell them to purchase a pill dispenser, that's just a stupid answer. And then A, um, just telling them what to do and is the first part of the teach back method, but then you have to do choice C and say, tell me when you're supposed to take your blue pill. So that's the better answer. Next case. A patient reveals to his psychiatrist that he's having homicidal ideation with a plan to murder his neighbor with a butcher's knife. He details a date, time, and method for how he will attempt to harm his neighbor. The psychiatrist concludes that his homicidality is the direct result of the patient's delusion that his wife is cheating on him with the neighbor. So that's why he wants to kill the neighbor. He, he incorrectly believes he has this fixed false belief, aka a delusion, that his neighbor is cheating on him uh, or excuse me, that his wife is cheating on him with his neighbor. So the question is, which of the following is the best immediate action that the psychiatrist should take? A, encourage the patient to refrain from violence. B, report the threat to police. C, involuntarily hospitalize the patient on an inpatient psychiatric unit. D, first report the threat to the police, then hospitalize the patient on an inpatient psychiatric unit. Or E, call the patient's neighbor and warn them directly. Pause the video if you'd like to think about this one. And if you're ready, here we go. So the correct answer choice here is E, call the patient's neighbor and warn them directly. So this is a really high yield question that I think everybody should know. So there's a couple reasons that I wrote this. The first is about what's known as the duty to warn. So there was this famous case out of California where a patient was seeing a psychologist and this patient told the psychologist, this is called the, the Tarasov case, by the way, the patient told the psychologist that he had plans to murder an, an ex-girlfriend or somebody that he had somewhat been romantically involved in. And the psychologist did not directly warn the target of the violence. And then a couple weeks later, this guy actually carried out the murder and did murder this, this patient. And the psychologist basically came under scrutiny and, and legal difficulty because he never warned the patient. So the Tarasov decision says that all providers have what's known as a duty to warn. So in a scenario like this, the first and most correct answer, the most immediate action is that you call the patient's neighbor or you call the target of their homicidal threat if there is a target 
and you warn them directly. The other reason that I wrote this question is because you should know the criteria for inpatient involuntary psychiatric commitment. So those criteria are that patients are either a danger to themselves or a danger to others or have an inability to care for themselves. So three criteria, danger to self, inability to care for self, or danger to others, all because of a direct result of their mental illness. So in those situations, you can involuntarily hospitalize the patient on an inpatient psychiatric unit. But the reason that choice C is not correct is because even though this patient is homicidal because of a psychiatric problem, and therefore should probably be involuntarily hospitalized, as choice C says, the most correct immediate action is you have to exercise your duty to warn and call the patient's neighbor directly. So that's why choice E is correct. Now, if you were going to try to warn the patient's neighbor and you couldn't get a hold of them, then you do contact the police. But the most immediate correct answer is to, is to exercise the duty to warn and try to call the patient's neighbor first. Then you would call the police if you couldn't reach them. And then you would try to involuntarily hospitalize this patient on an inpatient psychiatric unit because they are a danger to other people as a direct result of mental illness. So lots of different high yield points here. These are ethical scenarios that you probably don't hear a lot of in medical school, but you should totally know this as you're going into medicine. And this could 100%, excuse me, 100% show up on USMLE or Comlex. Next question. A physician is ordering a lumbar puncture for a patient with suspected meningitis. He orders the test on the wrong patient, but 10 minutes later, he catches his mistake before the test is incorrectly performed on the wrong patient. So this is a doctor that is ordering a lumbar puncture. He accidentally puts the order in for the wrong patient, but before that wrong patient has the lumbar puncture done, the physician catches his mistake. He corrects the mistake, orders the lumbar puncture for the actual patient, and then goes about his business. So the first of two questions. In this case, the scenario described is A, A, breach, B, duty, C, near miss, D, malpractice, or E, negligence. Think about this for a couple seconds. And here we go. The correct answer is C, near miss. So somewhat obvious perhaps, but a near miss is when a mistake almost happens. It's when the physician almost makes a critical mistake. However, he catches himself or somebody else catches the mistake before the patient can be incorrectly harmed. So this is termed near miss. Question two of two. What is the physician's responsibility to the patient who has incorrectly ordered the lumbar puncture but never ultimately received it? So stated otherwise, what is the physician's responsibility to that patient who shouldn't have had the lumbar puncture ordered and who never got it because he realized his mistake? A, nothing. No breach was committed. B, nothing. The near miss was identified. C, disclose the mistake to the patient. D, disclose the mistake to the internal review board. E, disclose the mistake to the hospital ethics committee. Pause the video if you need some time to think about this. And if you're ready, let's keep it rolling. So the correct answer here is that you do actually have to disclose the mistake to the patient that you incorrectly ordered the test on. So I know this seems kind of funny because nothing happened. They're fine. You caught your mistake. But we're taking USMLE and Comlex after all. And the most correct ethical answer is that you have to go and tell the patient, hey, look, I ordered a test that was meant for another patient and I accidentally ordered it for you. You didn't get it done because I caught my mistake, but I just have the ethical and moral responsibility to tell you that I made that mistake and I own that mistake and I'm deeply sorry for having done that. So you go and you tell them, you disclose the mistake. So high yield takeaway from this question is that on USMLE and Comlex, you always 100% of the time disclose the mistake, apologize for the mistake and own it. That's always going to be the correct answer on these questions on USMLE and Comlex. Next question. A physician involved in a case is at lunch with a colleague who happens to be another physician in the hospital who works as this, on the same unit as you or the physician. The attending physician wants to discuss details of the case with his colleague who's not involved in the direct care of the patient. Which of the following is true? A. The attending can discuss general details of the case if he de-identifies all protected health information. B. The attending can discuss all aspects of the case with his colleague since they're both physicians in the same hospital. C. 
the attending can discuss all aspects of the case with his colleague since they're both physicians in the same unit. Or D, the attending can discuss no details of the case, even de-identify general information, since the other physician is not directly involved in the care of the patient. Pause the video if you'd like some time to talk about this question with your loved one. And if you're ready, here we go. The correct answer choice here is A, that the attending physician can discuss general details of the case if he de-identifies all protected health information. So maybe some of you have never been in a hospital setting before and you're still in the preclinical years of medical school, but this happens all the time. So we take information from cases and we de-identify all protected health information. So things like patient name, date of birth, all the information that could potentially identify them. We de-identify aspects of the case, and then we present the case in a clinical setting where we talk with colleagues. That is totally okay and completely ethical. Though all that you have to know is that you have to de-identify the PHI, which is the protected health information. If you do that, you can discuss details of cases with other health professionals in a purely educational setting. Okay, so that's the correct answer and the reason that I wrote this question. Next case, a patient is diagnosed with lymphoma. The patient's family requests that you don't tell the patient of his diagnosis because, quote, I really don't think he'll be able to handle this news. Question one of three. Which of the following is the best initial course of action? A. Explain that you're legally required to inform the patient. B. Explain that you can withhold the information if all next of kin agree. C. Explain that if the patient has capacity, you cannot withhold the information. D. Attempt to understand why the patient's family doesn't want him to know his diagnosis. Or E, explain that you'll withhold the information. Pause the question if you need some time. And if you're an ethics expert, let's just get right into it. So the correct answer here is D. Attempt to understand why the patient's family doesn't want him to know his diagnosis. So if you've been following along, you know that the initial response that you should take when there's some sort of contentious scenario is to take that neutral stance and attempt to understand. Most of the answers that start with attempt to understand are going to be the correct answer. So if you're taking a guess, please guess the one that starts with attempt to understand. Next question, question two of three. In most circumstances, which of the following prevents you from being able to withhold information? So again, the patient's family said, please don't tell the patient of their diagnosis. And now the question is, what prevents you from doing that? A, the patient has decision-making capacity. B, the patient has legal competency. C, the patient is not brain dead. D, the patient has not elected a medical power of attorney. Or E, the patient's next of kin are not in agreement. Pause the video if you need some time. And if you're ready, let's hit it. The next answer is A, the patient has decision-making capacity. So in most circumstances, the reason that you have to tell the patient is because they have capacity and it is their right to know their diagnosis. You cannot withhold information unless one exception is met. And let's talk about that exception right now. Question three of three. If the patient might hurt himself or others by way of learning his diagnosis, which of the following is the best immediate course of action? A. Request a psychiatric evaluation. B. Withhold the diagnosis by invoking therapeutic privilege. C. Withhold the diagnosis by invoking dangerousness criteria. D. Do not withhold the diagnosis, but request a psychiatric evaluation. Or E. Do not withhold the diagnosis, but attempt to understand why the patient might hurt himself or others. Pause the video if you need a couple minutes. And if you're ready, let's do it. Correct answer here is B, withhold the diagnosis by invoking therapeutic privilege. So as I alluded to on the previous slide, this is the only scenario where you are ethically and legally allowed to withhold information from a patient. If the patient might hurt themselves or others because of their diagnosis, or because of the information that you'll give them, you're allowed to use what's known as therapeutic privilege and withhold that information. So in this question, the correct answer is B. C is incorrect because dangerous criteria, dangerousness criteria only has to do with um, criteria for psychiatric involuntary admission. When you're taking ethics questions, you're never, ever, 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 ever going to get a consult or request some other specialty in the hospital to come see the patient. So a is wrong and anytime you see, you know, request oncology to come or request psych psychiatry to come, it's never correct. 
Um, and then the other answer question, the other questions are, uh, excuse me, the other answers are incorrect. And even though E says attempt to understand, it's not correct because you're not not withholding it. So you, you have to you have to withhold the diagnosis because they might hurt other people. So because the first part of choice E says do not withhold, it's incorrect. So that's the purpose of that case. Very, very high yield to know the exception known as therapeutic privilege. All right, let's keep it going. Uh, a 15 year old patient gives birth to a healthy newborn. The parents of the patient, her legal guardians, want the patient to give up the newborn for adoption. However, the patient does not want to give up the newborn for adoption and instead plans to keep the child. The patient's mother pulls you aside and says, quote, she is not ready to care for a child. Look at her. She's only 15. This child will not be cared for and both my husband and I will take no part in raising this baby. Which of the following is correct? A, the patient is allowed to keep the newborn. B, the patient is allowed to keep the newborn only if she can demonstrate a reasonable plan for how to care for the child. C, the patient is not allowed to keep the newborn. D, it entirely depends on the applicable state law. Or E, consult the ethics committee. So in this question, this is a really high yield ethical scenario that's going to come up quite a bit. And the answer is that the patient is allowed to keep the newborn. So as soon as a patient gives birth, they're emancipated. And I have a video on emancipated minors that you should go and watch for more information regarding this topic. But as soon as a patient gives birth, they are allowed to make their own decisions regarding themselves and their newborn. And their legal guardian, so in this case, the 15-year-old's legal guardian, has no say on whether or not she keeps the child. And it doesn't matter if she can demonstrate a reasonable plan, so choice B is wrong. The patient is allowed to keep the newborn because it's her decision, it's her child, and by giving birth, she's emancipated. So that's why I wrote this question, and it's very, very high yield. Next case. A patient who was involved in a traumatic and brutal attack has reconstructive facial surgery. Post-surgery, she has significant surgical scarring and bruising. The patient comes back for a follow-up visit and tells you that she's depressed and feels like a hideous monster. Which of the following is the best initial response? A. I'm so sorry that you feel this way. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. B. I'm so sorry that you feel this way. Your scars are temporary and will heal soon. C. Why do you feel hideous? D. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. It must be difficult to have facial scars and bruising. Or E. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. Your scars and bruises look fine and are a normal part of the healing process. So pause the video if you want to think about this one. And if you're ready, let's continue. So the correct answer here is D. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. It must be difficult to have facial scars and bruising. Now, a couple principles here that are really high yield. When a patient comes to you and tells you that they feel ugly, what you absolutely do not want to do is tell them that they look fine, okay? You don't want to tell them that they're fine, and you also don't want to use medical jargon to rationalize that it might be okay in the future. So choice B is definitely wrong. Now, choice C says, why do you feel hideous? And that is good because you're attempting to understand why the patient feels hideous. But before you do that, you have to first acknowledge their feelings. And that's why choice D is the better initial response. Because you're giving them that moment to say, hey, look, I'm sorry. This must be really hard for you. And after you acknowledge their feelings, then you transition to something like choice C and say, tell me why you feel hideous. I mean, you, you know why they feel hideous. They have all these scars and stuff. But still, that's how you do it. Um, choice E is wrong because you absolutely don't tell them that the scars and bruises look fine. Choice B is wrong because you don't use medical rationalization to tell them that this is temporary. And choice A sounds really nice, but you're the physician, so there's, you have to first take that stance of neutrality. That's why choice D is the best answer. Let's keep rolling, guys. I know these are a lot of cases, but I'm trying to hammer home high yield concepts, so let's keep this momentum going. Next case says, a patient you care for is being seen around the holiday times. She brings a tray of cookies, expensive football tickets, and a card, that, uh, thank you card to your office. Which of the following gifts, if any, should you accept? A, the card only. B, the card and cookies only. C, the card, cookies, and football tickets. D, none. It is never okay to accept gifts from patients. Or E, none. Only gifts that directly benefit patients can be accepted. Pause the video if you want to think about what gifts you can accept. And if you're ready, I will tell you what gifts you can accept. So the answer here is B, the card and the cookies. So 
the, the basically the rule of thumb is that you can only accept gifts of minimal value and different sources will put different dollar amounts on these things and honestly you shouldn't memorize a dollar amount you should just know the principle that minimal value only is acceptable so cookies a card these are minimal value items so you, you can accept those but football tickets presumably an expensive item you absolutely cannot take that Choice E says that only gifts that directly benefit patients can be accepted, and that is true. Gifts that directly benefit patients can, in fact, be accepted. But because we're talking about football tickets, cookies, and a thank you card, it's sort of a moot point and therefore is irrelevant for the purpose of this high-yield question. So summary takeaway from this question is only gifts of minimal value and gifts that directly benefit patients can be accepted. All right, next case, and this is a three-parter. A patient is found down in the community and suffers a massive intracerebral hemorrhage. She is ventilated in the ICU for days in a comatose state. Question one of three says, in order to formally pronounce the patient dead, all of the following are required except for which of the following? A, absence of withdrawal to painful stimuli. B, absence of the oculovestibular reflex. C, reversibility of the coma. D, absence of the corneal reflex or E, the exclusion of toxic metabolic causes. Pause the video if you want to think about this. And if you're ready, here we go. So the answer is C, reversibility of the coma. So in this situation, we're talking about pronouncing a patient as formally dead. And in order to do that, you have to show certain criteria. Now, the first is that there has to be the complete absence of all brainstem reflexes. So A, B, and D are all brainstem reflexes. So you have to show that they're all absent. The other thing that you have to do is rule out all toxic metabolic causes, because after all, if somebody has an overdose on something or they have some type of encephalopathy or anything that's reversible, whether it's toxic, metabolic, what have you, those are all things that are reversible and the patient might not die. So if you can figure that out and reverse it, then they'll live. So you have to exclude toxic metabolic causes. The reason that choice C is correct is because reversibility of coma is not one of the things that you do to pronounce a patient as dead. So that's the reason I wrote the first part of the question. Now let's move on to part two. This condition of formal death is termed blank and usually requires blank physicians. So A, it's termed brain death and usually requires one physician. B, it's termed brain death and usually requires at least two physicians. C, it's termed brain death and usually requires at least three or d uh, this is termed irreversible coma and usually requires one physician and e this is termed irreversible coma and usually requires at least two physicians so i'll give you three seconds or pause the video if you need more and here we go the answer is that this is called brain death and it usually requires at least two physicians. So again, the usually requires part is going to vary state to state, hospital to hospital. But in most general circumstances, two physicians have to agree that the patient is brain dead. And then going back to question one, what are they? What does brain death consist of? Well, it consists of things like the absence of brainstem reflexes and the exclusion of all reversible causes and that certain vital signs uh, are not relevant. So that's what brain death is. And two physicians usually have to agree and say that this patient is brain dead, at which point they're formally dead. Question three of three, the patient's family insists on keeping the patient hooked up to life support, even though the patient has been declared brain dead by at least two physicians, which of the following is the best immediate response? A, I'm so sorry for your loss. We will maintain life support. B, I'm so sorry for your loss, but we'll need to disconnect life support. C, I'm so sorry for your loss, but brain death is irreversible and we are ethically required to remove life support. D, I'm so sorry for your loss. I will discuss this with the ethics committee. E, I'm so sorry for your loss, but brain death is irreversible and we are ethically required to make you aware that we will discuss removing life support with the ethics committee. Pause the video if you'd like to think about this ethical conundrum. And if you're ready, here we go. The answer here is E. So when someone's brain dead, if the family doesn't want them to come off of life support, what you need to tell them is in the most respectful and understanding way possible is, look, your loved one is gone. Brain death is irreversible. And ethically, this will probably, the life support will probably be withdrawn. But I will discuss this with the ethics committee if you're against it. So the reason that you go to the ethics committee is because the family doesn't want it withdrawn, even though 
it's going to ultimately be withdrawn, right? The patient's brain dead. They're not coming back from that. But you tell them that, look, you know, I'll talk with the ethics committee, but this is irreversible and your, your loved one is brain dead. Okay. So that's why choice E is the best immediate response. Next case, a patient has a dangerously low hemoglobin and requires a blood transfusion. And um, this is a three-part question. So the first of three questions says that assuming the patient is a 34-year-old competent male with full decision-making capacity who refuses the transfusion, which of the following is the best initial course of action? A, allow the patient to refuse the transfusion. B, allow the patient to refuse the transfusion only after discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives. C, allow the patient to refuse the transfusion only after signing an against medical advice document. D, do not allow the patient to refuse the transfusion as it is considered emergency treatment. E, do not allow the patient to refuse the transfusion as it is considered negligence to do so. So the correct answer here is B, allow the patient to refuse the transfusion only after discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives. So if you have an adult who has full decision-making capacity, then if they want to refuse something that is really good for them and could save their life, then whatever, screw it. They're allowed to refuse it. But you have to talk about risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment before you can actually say, all right, fine, you can refuse it. And then you'll document that, look, I talked with them about risks. I talked with them about benefits, alternatives, and I deem them to have full capacity. So that's why I wrote part one. Now, part two says that let's instead assume that the patient is a four-year-old unconscious male, but they're accompanied by their legal guardian, who's obviously conscious, and the legal guardian says don't transfuse the patient. Which of the following is correct? A, do not transfuse the patient, or B, transfuse the patient. So I'll pause the video if you want to think about this one. And if you're ready, the answer is B. So in this case, we're talking about a minor. And in, in this case, it doesn't matter what the legal guardian says. This is an unconscious minor who's going to require something that's deemed as life-saving. Okay? You have to do it. It's an emergency. You have to give them the blood transfusion. Now let's talk about question three of three. So now let's pretend that the patient is a 30-year-old unconscious female, presumably requiring an emergency blood transfusion, but their adult partner who's conscious says, hey, don't transfuse them. Now what's correct? A, do not transfuse the patient, or B, transfuse the patient. Pause the video if you want some time. And the correct answer to this one is that you don't transfuse them. So because they're an adult and their significant other or partner, next of kin, if you will, knows their wishes, because the patient is not a minor, in this case, you respect the wishes of their next of kin and you do not transfuse them. So I wrote this three-part question to highlight the difference between what you do if it's a minor versus an adult with the legal guardian or next of kin telling you what to do. So very, very high yield concepts and please know those differences. Next case, a patient comes to an urgent care clinic where you work for some unknown reason. While the patient's in the waiting room, the patient collapses. You come out, you rapidly assess the patient, and you determine that there is a need for a somewhat invasive intervention. However, the patient has not yet signed any consent forms, and her religion slash wishes are unknown. Which of the following is correct? A, you may treat the patient on the basis that she came voluntarily to an urgent care clinic. B, you may treat the patient on the basis that she requires what may be life-saving intervention. C, do not treat the patient. Until consent forms are signed, you are legally unable to provide treatment. D, do not treat the patient. An urgent care clinic is not considered an emergency setting. E, do not treat the patient. She may have religious or spiritual wishes that preclude her from receiving certain treatments. Pause the video if you need some time. And if you're ready, here's the answer. So the answer is that you can treat the patient because they came to an urgent care clinic. So in this case, the act of going to a, an office or a clinic is implied consent. And the, the concept of implied consent is really important. So if a patient is in the emergency room waiting room or in the urgent care waiting room or in the waiting room of your office and something happens, because they've gone out of their way to go seek medical care and get a medical opinion, they are implying that they're consenting to that medical care. So you don't need them to sign forms and you don't need to know their religious preferences. If they're there, and they have implied consent, and they're unconscious and unable to communicate with you, you treat them. So that's the reason I wrote this question. Incredibly high yield to know. This shows up all the damn time. 
Next case. A 40-year-old obese Hispanic female has right upper quadrant pain for three days. A surgeon performs a cholecystectomy sex wow, that's a mouthful, a cholecystectomy successfully, but 72 hours later, the patient develops fever, worsening right upper quadrant pain, and returns for reevaluation. An x-ray is performed, which is shown below. And what you see there is a pair of scissors in the abdomen. Um, I've just moved that picture out of the way. And now the question says, which of the following terms best applies to this situation? A, sentinel event. B, respondeat superior, and I'm probably butchering that. C, res ipsa loquitur, and again, I'm probably butchering that, sorry. D, intentional breach, or E, near miss. Pause the video if you want to think about how the hell we're going to get these scissors out of this person's chest. And if you're ready, here's the answer. The answer is C, res ipsa loquitur. So this is a Latin phrase that directly translates into the thing speaks for itself. So this is um, a component of malpractice, right? So when the thing speaks for itself, or when you look at an x-ray of something left inside of a surgical abdomen, then it speaks for itself, right? The physician is very much liable in this situation. So on tests, the way that this will come up is they'll show you an x-ray or they'll show you a picture of something that is so obviously negligent and wrong that the, the person who did it is very liable. And that's what res ipsa loquitur means. So the thing speaks for itself. I mean, look at that. The scissors are there in the chest. This x-ray, the thing that was done, it speaks for itself. The physician is liable. Now, the other thing I want to point out and the reason that I wrote this question is because these two Latin phrases come up all the damn time on USMLE and Comlex. And the choice B is respondeat superior, and what that directly translates to is let the master answer. So this is a completely different scenario, but let me just take a second to explain what this one means so that you'll also get this one right on test day. So let's say that you have a doctor's office, it's your practice, um, and you hire a nurse, and the nurse is drawing somebody's blood and like punctures an artery and the person has a massive bleed and they have to be rushed to the emergency room. And then that patient sues you because of what your employee did. The question on tests will be, are you liable for that? And the answer is a resounding yes. So, and the reason that you are liable is choice B. In that case, the answer would be respondeat superior, which means let the master answer. So anytime somebody who works directly beneath you or for you messes up and does something wrong and creates liability, you are liable because they answer to you. So respondeat superior is the Latin phrase that means let the master answer. And that is for cases where people who work beneath you mess up and you're liable. Okay, guys. Wow. My throat really hurts after talking that much about 30 cases in ethics. And that's the end of this video. I hope that these were useful to you. Again, some of these questions, they've got a lot of answers that sound really good. And the purpose of this video is to create a discussion about scenarios where we can generate patterns and use pattern recognition on test day to identify ethical concepts that we should know. So please, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Drop a comment, drop a like, please share it with your friends. I'm going to go drink some hot tea because my throat is about to explode. But I hope that this was helpful to you. Best of luck. And remember to check out the other videos that I have in the ethics series to learn more background knowledge. Good luck.